Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry where it is our mission to minister and feed the Word of God to the body of Christ. Visit our website at ubcchurch.org where we offer free full-length video and audio Bible study lessons taught verse by verse. Select a speaker, topic, or series and click filter to view the Bible lesson of your choice. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with each verse by scrolling to the bottom of each Bible study video. If you are in need of prayer, you can visit our website and fill out the prayer request form. Please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also ask that you visit the prayer list and pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Last but not least, the United Body of Christ app is available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone app store. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and to welcome you back to another broadcast, back to another Bible study. Very powerful lesson coming at you today uh, from Isaiah chapter 49. We're on Isaiah chapter 49. It's very, very prophetic. And uh, just some interesting uh, tidbits uh, as, as my wife and I were studying uh, this, this chapter here and just some of the things that God has opened up for us. And um, we, we're eager to share them with you, so we're very excited. As always, before we get started, we like to go before the Lord. We love to go before the Lord in prayer. Amen. Our Father, thou art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom comes. Thine will be done upon this earth just as your will is done in heaven. Give unto us this day our daily bread. Your majesty, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We ask that you would pardon our transgressions. Forgive us of our debts. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that have trespassed against us. Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from the hands of the evil one. Father, we ask that you would lead us, not into temptation, but that you would deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory and it's now and forevermore. It's in Jesus' name in which we pray. Your majesty, we assemble before you this day, the day that you have set before all of us. We take this opportunity to give you thanks for giving us the strength to assemble before you. We take this opportunity to say thank you, Lord, because through Jesus Christ, we, you have acknowledged us, for we have acknowledged the only begotten Son of God, Him being our Lord and our Savior. And it's because of Him, while we are able to lay our eyes on you, that our prayers are heard of you and answered of by you, that we seek you because of Him, that we are even made your sons and your daughters because of your only begotten son. And Father, we acknowledge that this was your plan of salvation from the beginning, that you would redeem the whole world unto yourself and make all of us your sons and daughters just as you would have had it at the beginning. So Father, we say thank you. Thank you even for allowing your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be crucified on the cross, allowing him to become that lamb of God. And we acknowledge him now as this lion of the tribe of Judah. 
So to God be the glory forever and ever. Jesus, thank you for being the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for being even our high priest in heaven. Father, within this day in which we assembled before you, we prepare ourselves to feast and to be edified and to be inspired, to be strengthened, to be endowed with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from the word of God. And God, I thank you that you never forsake us. I thank you that you never leave us, but that you're always willing to draw unto us if we are willing to draw unto you. So Father, here we are looking at at the seat at the table, Father, looking at the spread over the table, God, taking our place and ready to eat from the word of God. And we ask, Father, that as we take in the word, that you would help us to understand what it is that that you are saying, what it is that you have spoken, what shall come to pass, what has already come to pass. Help us to receive, help us to understand, help us to obey, break the chains of our yokes, deliver those who need delivering, O God. Continue to call so many out of darkness into the light and the love of God manifested even in Jesus who is the Christ, the only begotten of the Father. I thank you for the works that you've already performed, the prayers that you've already answered, the mysteries that you have already made known, the healing that you've already sent out, the mountains that you've already moved, the rain that you've allowed to fall. I thank you for such things, God. I thank you for such things, God. The battles that you've already fought on our behalf. I thank you for the answer that has already been on the way even before we positioned ourselves to ask you. Be glorified. Be magnified. You are God. You are the only wise, true God. You are the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. You are the sovereign king of the universe. All things are yours. And I thank you for it, God. I thank you, Father, for even creating us. I thank you for allowing us to choose you. You didn't make us. You showed us your love and left it up to us to decide to love you in return. And you are so good. How could we not love you in return? So I thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand this text that we read, help us to understand the prophecies, and help us to declare your truth to the masses, those that would hear this message, O God. And not just this this message, not just this service, Father, but you have so many messengers that are, are out and abroad, so many places where the Spirit is that are leading and guiding and calling people out of darkness. Father, continue doing your marvelous work to redeem the whole world unto you through Jesus Christ. The sons and the daughters are prophesying, men are are dreaming dreams, God, because you've poured your spirit out upon the world. So to God be the glory. We rejoice in you. We glorify you because you are worthy and you are holy and you are true. You are to be feared and you are to be reverenced. You are the God of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and you are his Father. You are our Father. You are our God. And I thank you, Father. I thank you for what you've done for us individually and collectively. I thank you, Father, for the ways that you've made for us, the doors that you've opened, the path that you made straight for us, O God. Thank you. Be glorified. Have your way in this Bible study. Have your way in the mouths of your messengers this day, O God. Give your people strength to declare your truth. 
and let some, let those who you've called hear, receive, and proclaim Jesus as Lord. These things we ask and give thanks in prayer. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we make our petitions known unto thee. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we rejoice in you, for you are the joy of our salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen. Folks, again, I thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study. Very powerful uh, passage of scripture for us to read today. Really, really, really looking forward to it. And uh, we like to get right into it. Uh, this is our way of trying to streamline. Uh, it used to be that we were so long at the beginning of our videos that uh, people were fast forwarding in 20, 30 minutes into the video to get to, to the actual Bible study. So we've, over the course of time, we've done what we can to streamline that. Amen. As always, God is the chef. We, this is our way of giving glory to the Godhead. God is the chef. The bread that he has prepared for us all to break and to receive, it's the word of God. It's the bread of life. We acknowledge him as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the word, he is the bread, and he is the only begotten son of God. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit that has invited your family and yourselves, my family and myself, that even through this broadcast that we can come together, that we can shepherd that we can sup, rather, uh, fellowship and commune. commune. Uh, we get a chance to, to read your comments or, or your emails, and it's because of these broadcasts, and, and God led you to our website or to our Bible studies, and, and we have a way that we fellowship with you. Uh, you we, the bread that we take in, you've been, you've been taking in that bread as well. So what we serve to you, we take in for ourselves because God has made it so for all of us to be able to enjoy it. So again, that's our way of giving honor to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. My wife and myself, our job is to serve what God has prepared. So any understanding that you receive, any enlightenment, any, any uh, a revelation that God has endowed you with, you know, that he has bestowed upon you, it's because he intended for you to have it. You know, our job is just to serve you with it. Amen. Um, speaking of honor, I, I, I always take this opportunity to acknowledge my wife. Uh, she is my best friend. She is the business partner of our endeavors. Amen. Uh, and I bless, bless God for the kind of person she is. She's, a, she's when I say a man, she knows how to manage things. Um, she's, she manages our finances. She manages the the daily going zones of our lives and uh, our children and, and myself, we notice if, if, if mom or if my wife is down, we call her mom. If she's down, we notice how it has an effect on us and, and we're, we're always looking towards her because it's not just what she does, it's who she is. God has given us the complete package in her. You know, the things that she manages within our lives, the things that she does to help us all, and the way that she loves us. And so I bless God to have a woman like that, a woman that goes to him and seeks him daily, amen, and then spends her time with her family and loves her family, family genuinely. So I bless God to have such a woman that way, amen, who is my friend, my partner, and my help. So to God be the glory for allowing me to be able to be loved that way and to love in return, having acknowledged what he has done for me. Uh, man may not eat by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord our God. Without any further ado, I'll turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. Here's what it says. Listen, O owls, unto me. So all the coastlines, God is, God is putting us all on notice, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. Listen, look at what he says. Listen, O owls, unto me, and hearken, ye people from far. So again, he's talking to the Gentiles. The Lord has called me from, my, from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, had he made mention of my name. Now, 
when I, when I first read this, I was a little confused. I read this sometime not too long ago, and I, I found myself being a little confused. I was like, ah, who, that's, who's, is that Isaiah talking? And there were some things that kind of, you know how you make something harder than it has to be, and, or you read too much into something. And so all of a sudden, I, I began to jump ahead and be like, which prophet is that, right? But look, look, this gets real heavy. This gets real deep. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. All of a sudden, I'm like, well, that sounds like Jesus. Wait a minute now. And then the shadow of his hand, he hid me and made me as a polished shaft in his quiver had he hit me. So it's talking that God is using this, this, this um, prophet. It's talking like God is using this prophet, if you will, this servant, as you will as like an arrow, a, a special arrow that God will have in the quiver uh, uh, of, his, uh, of where his arrows are. He has this one special one, right? Like this is part of his arsenal, right? And he said unto me, thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Okay? This gets deep now. Watch this. Listen to this. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my works with my God. I began to think, all of a sudden, it became clear to me. And, and maybe it's going to be just as clear to you as it is to me. I'm going to read down to uh, verse 6. But then we're going, we're going to talk about the things that lead up to verse 6. So I'll reread verse four, because again, this is going to get pretty heavy. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. So this is a person that's saying it, everything I did is for nothing. Everything that I'm going to be doing is for nothing. Look at what's going to happen. It's, it's almost like there is a piece of information that they haven't been privy to yet. And they're, and they're saying, all this that, that you're going to have me doing, but they're not going to receive it. And then the person concludes by saying, well, I can't be worried about if they receive it or not. The Lord knows that I'm going to do his will and I'm going to give my all to, to, to glorifying him. And that's how he concludes verse four. And I'll reread it one more time. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. So this is a person that's saying that all the work I did and they're not getting it. They, they, they won't live by it. They won't receive it. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord. So it's saying I can't be worried about that. I have to just leave it in God's hands. And then it says, in my work with my God. So he says, I have to, God have to, I have to do what I do unto the Lord, not, not towards his people, but unto the Lord, even though I'm here to serve him, to, to help his people to find him. Ultimately, I got to leave it in God's hands. I can't be worried about the end or the outcome. And once you start understanding that this is Jesus that, that's talking here, and it starts getting real deep. Because he says, I have labored in vain. And we're going to talk about this, but let me read down to verse 6. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation until the end of the earth. Man, that is heavy. So this was Jesus talking. Now what you start to see is you're, you're, once you understand that that's actually the Lord Jesus that's speaking, and it's a conversation that God is having with his son, there's two people there. This is a conversation. It's like God is saying, here's going to be your mandate. 
I'm going to have you to do this. And don't get discouraged because they're not going to receive you. They're not going to receive what I'm sending you for. They're not going to receive it. But don't worry about that because ultimately I'll be glorified by the work you do because you won't just be saving Israel. You won't just be gathering Israel unto me, but through you, the whole world will be gathered unto me. So don't be discouraged. It's like he was telling Jesus before Jesus came to the earth. It's like he was telling Jesus what the mandate was before he did it. And Jesus was saying, I, 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 I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain because Jesus was seeing that they wouldn't get it. Now, we're going to get some scriptures. This gets real heavy here. This gets heavy. Hold your place there. We already read verse six. And he said, it is a light thing that, that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore. God is saying it was a no brainer for me that I would send you. I've said all the prophets before, but it was a no brainer that ultimately you would be the one before the foundations of the earth were laid that you would be the one to go and you would redeem not only Jacob or which is another name for Israel but you would redeem the whole world to me that's a no-brainer and he says I will give thee for a light to the Gentiles now hold your place there let's start looking and let's start breaking this down go with me to um, Mark chapter 13 and let's look at verses 1 through 13. Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Look at what this says. So Jesus begins to tell the disciples some things here. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus, and, and it's, it's typical of people, we, we, how many brag about the places of worship, about how it looked, how well it was put together. You Maybe you, you belong to a, a place of worship. I, notice, I, I don't say, the, no, I don't say the, the building being the church. I'm very, very careful. If you, follow my, if you followed our Bible studies uh, uh, for some time, then you know that I don't look at the building as the church. I always look at the people. So I call the building the place of worship. So in this regard, ha have you ever looked at your place of worship and you looked at the craftsmanship of the place of worship, how well it was put together, how much money you, your, your place of worship spent on putting this structure together, right? And it's maybe it's the size of a coliseum and maybe it's so big that not only do you have this main place, but then y'all have satellite campuses and, and you marvel at the size and the decadence of it. Well, you're, no, you're not alone in that regard because the disciples did the same thing concerning the temple of God. And this is what you read. As they went out of the temple, one of the disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And they were looking at the, the way that the temple was built, built up and all. How the, majest, the, the, the majesty, the majestics of the temple. And Jesus answering and said, Seest thou these great buildings? There should, not left, there should not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus was, was, was shown the destruction of, of, of Jerusalem uh, that would take place in, in AD 70. Okay? And, and, he, and so Jesus begins to tell the disciples of the events that will occur down the line some 40 years after his ascension okay and as he sat upon the mount of olives he was uh, the 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 mountain of all the you'll hear the the olivet the mountain of olives uh, uh over against the temple peter and james and john and andrew asked him privately or they asked him secretly tell us where should these things be when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all of these things shall be fulfilled okay so the so Jesus begins to break down some things. In verse 5, Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye, it say, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdoms against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in various places or diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. 
These are the beginnings of sorrow. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogues, you shall be beaten. So you would think that you would go into a place of worship for protection. And when you go into the, when, when these times come in the places of worship, this is where there'll be the most danger. You'll be beaten in these places of worship. And this particularly, you should be uh, uh, beaten in the temple. And you'll be, de you'll be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. Uh, for a testimony against them. So God is saying, Jesus is saying that there has to be martyrs when this time comes because the case have to be made against certain people. So there has to be certain martyrs to play this role so that the case can be made against certain people. Okay? And that's what it's saying here. Uh, you, you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Okay? And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand. What you, so, so when they say, but when they shall lead you, they, they're going to take you into custody, if you will. When they shall come and, and grab you, if you will. Okay, That's when they come and arrest you. Uh, and deliver you up. Take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do you premeditate. But, whos but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour that ye speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the brother shall be betrayed. The, the brother shall betray the brother to death. The father, the son. The children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. So we read Mark uh, 1 through 13. That kind of answers what Jesus was saying in verse 4 here. Then I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord. So he's saying that no matter how I told him about things that would happen, they still wouldn't heed my warnings. And so when you think about what happened in AD, in AD 70, the siege that the Romans uh, 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 just, just did, the, the six-month siege before the Romans came in and completely wiped Jerusalem out. You know, this, the atrocities that took place during that time. Okay? So there was things that the Jews just wouldn't get. And so that kind of sets the tone when, when Jesus starts talking about the things that would happen, right? Now, drop down to verse 32. Drop down to verse 32. But of that day and of that hour no, knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. That's deep. Now you kind of understand in a sense, hopefully you understand this when he says, then I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. There, it's like Jesus, it's like if I'm telling you, it's like the father is having a conversation with the son and he's, he's showing the son all things about what's going to happen. Hold, hold your place there, and, and I'll fill in the blank, but go with me real quick to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and let's take a look at verse, verse 20. John chapter 5, verse 20. Look at what this says here. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. So before Jesus came, God was showing him what he must do. And in my imagination, that as God is talking to Jesus and letting him know what the mandate is, God is saying that I'm going to have you come and rescue not only the, the Jews, but ultimately the Gentiles. Now, before this happens, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And then Jesus is saying, wait a minute, then I'm laboring in vain. Because how is this? How? How is this going to be the outcome? You know, I, I, I'm going to go and die for them. I got you. I'm, I, I'm, I'm ready for the charge. But will they appreciate it? 
How would they appreciate? Because look at what he says here. He says, then I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for not. But it's almost like God is saying, hold on. There's more to the story. And I know you'll say, well, pastor, how you get that? Because in the verse we just read in Mark chapter, in, in Mark chapter 13, Jesus says, no man knows the hour, not the angels, nor the son of man, nor the son. And so Jesus is saying there were some things that he wasn't privy to. There were some things that he was privy to, but at the time there were some things that he was not privy to. That's what that's what you get to, to the understanding. And now reread it. Go back to to uh, Mark chapter thirteen, verse thirty-two. Mark chapter thirteen, verse thirty-two, and look at what this says here. Now, we just talked about the atrocities, at least part of the atrocities that would happen in a future event. Jesus prophesied the, the, the atrocities that, that would take place against the Jews. Okay, And if you keep reading this, he talks about the atrocities that would happen in the latter days. You know, But ultimately, he talks about what was going to happen against the Jews. And so when it, when it, when it was time for him to put a time stamp on it, all he can do is call out uh, what there to be, what what we are to be watchful of. But he didn't. He wasn't able to call out the day and the exact the, the the time of day or the date itself. And he says here, but of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So Jesus himself didn't know. When that when the exact time that these things would happen, he knew what would happen, but he didn't know when the father would allow it to happen. So ultimately, as you read verse four here, at least in my imagination, what I conclude is God gives Jesus the mandate to come to the earth and to tell him what is what what his role will be while he's on the earth. And as Jesus looks over this and being the, the blessed son being the righteous hope that he is, he's looking at this thing and he was like, wait, you, you want me to do that for them? No problem. But look at what the, look at how they are. Look at what they're doing. Am, am I, am I, you, I'll do it. If that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. Right. But it seems that Jesus didn't like, like, look at it this way. My wife and I was talking. As we read the whole, as we read the whole Old Testament and as we read the New Testament, we look back and see that everything was as God said it would be because we are we, we, we have all the information. We're able to look back in hindsight and say, what you know, man, Jesus, he, we needed our Lord and Savior because without him, we we wouldn't have this. We wouldn't have that. But if you didn't have if we didn't, if we weren't privy of having that information, then we would kind of guess. If we didn't know what the outcome would be, our Bible tells us what the outcome is going to be. Even in the book of Revelation, you know, about the rapture, it tells us about how ultimately we'll be standing before the Lord our God. We know what the end is going to be. But there were some things that Jesus wasn't privy to know that the Father had not yet revealed to him. And that's and we see that in Mark where it says, no man knows the hour, not the angels in heaven and not the Son. So there were some things that God hadn't showed him yet. OK, now it's not to say that God had, that, that he don't know. He, he knows now. But during the time, there were some things that he had not known yet that God was still working some things out for him. And, and that's where you see him start to say in verse four, then I've said I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for not and in vain because the things that they had to go through during what uh, when Rome attacked them in AD 70 I mean if you read the stories of the atrocities the 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 the, the women were eating their young because of such a famine from the siege of what happened and they didn't have to go through that Jesus said he he cried when he would talk about it and in other passages of scripture he cried and he told them how he would have gathered them together as a as a as a hen gather her her little ones, as a chicken gather her little ones, if they would have just allowed him to, and that's why he can ask the question, I, "Have I labored in vain?" And but God, 
the sovereign God that he is, God is saying, it's not just the Jews that you'll be focusing on, but through you, I'm going to bring in the Gentiles. Not, not just the Jews, but through you, I'll bring in the Gentiles. And, this, and that's why I said the whole thing gets real deep because it's like a conversation that's taking place between the Father and the Son. And Jesus begins to let us know in verse 1. Listen, O owls, unto me, and hearken ye from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb, and from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. OK, and so Jesus begins to tell us, he begins to inform us about the conversation that he has with his father. And when his father tells him the mandate, he begins to say, have I labored in vain? Because look at all these things that's going to happen to them. But God tells them, don't just focus on that, because at the end, it's, it, it'll all come together. So we stopped at verse six and I'll reread verse six so we can go on to verse seven. He said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. Hold your place there. Go with me to Acts chapter 13, verses 26 through 49. So this lets me know when I read verse 6, then I knew for certain that it was talking about Jesus. I'm like, oh, everything began to come together for me. So now, verse 13 in Acts chapter, uh, I'm sorry, verse 26 through 49 in Acts chapter 13. So it says that Jesus will be a light to the Gentiles, Okay. So we'll read about this. We'll start at verse 26. Look at what this says here. Men and brethren, this is a sermon that's being preached to the, to the Jews. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham. So we know that that goes to the Jews, okay? And whosoever among, whosoever among you feareth God, to you, is, the, is this word of salvation. So this message is unto you that belongs to the children of Israel and to those that fear God. Okay? For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, Yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. Okay, so it makes you understand why Jesus would, would ask the why Jesus would make the statement, I have, what do he say, I have uh, labored in vain. It was so many things that he tried to keep them from, but they kept refusing him. They, they refused his teachings. They didn't have to go through the things that they went through d during, during the time of the Roman Empire. They, they wouldn't have had to go through that. Okay. But they kept refusing Jesus. And when they have fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree. That's what they called the cross and laid him in the sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. So it's talking about Jesus, how when, when he was taken down off the cross, he was laid to rest in the sepulcher, then God, he was laid to rest in the tomb, then God brought him up. And then not, did, not only did God raise him from the dead, but God allowed there to be witnesses that seen him, okay? So, so nobody could, could question if he was ever raised or did they just hide the body? No, God let there be witnesses to quell any disbelief, okay? Going on, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto this day. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised them up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he said also in another psalm, thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, he fell asleep, fell on asleep, and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption, meaning that 
he, his body is decaying. Okay, he, his body is decayed. He was laid to rest in the dirt, in the, in the dirt of the earth, and his body decayed. He saw death, and he lays in a state of death, okay, because he, he was laid to rest. That's, that's not what happened to Jesus. But he whom God raised saw no corruption. Now he's talking about Jesus. Jesus didn't go through that. He, God raised him so his body never saw corruption and never decayed. Okay, but it is known, but be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by and by him, all that believe are justified from all things uh, which you could not be justified of by the law of Moses. So through him, you are justified now. God has justified you. The law couldn't justify you. But through Christ. Now you receive justification. Beware, therefore, lest thou come upon you. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of of the prophets. Behold, you despisers, you wonder, you, you wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declared unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Okay? Uh, now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So what's happening here? Again, we're getting to the very reason why we're over here. The, the gospel was, was being preached to the Jews. The Jews didn't want to receive it. They didn't want to receive it. They began to kick, buck, and scream at it. They still wanted to hold on to the law of Moses. Again, it helps you to understand why Jesus would say, have I labored in vain? They, they didn't want, like, like it was preached to them, that the law is not, the law of Moses is not what's going to justify you. God has given you a new covenant through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. So the, what the law was trying to create and fulfill, the character that, was, that the law had intended to develop in each believer, that is now manifested in Jesus Christ, right? And now, through Jesus, we have what God was trying to manifest through the law. That's why it's through Jesus that we have this justification, okay? Now, this gets real interesting. We're reading down to 49. So we know that it was being preached to the Jews and, and, and the Jews resisted it because they wanted to hold on to the law of Moses. But notice what happened in 42. The Gentiles wanted some of what they heard. When the Jew, back in 42, when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next time. They were like, hey, we were just walking by and we heard what you were saying and... Um, Will that apply to us too? Remember what God said to Jesus? It's not just the Jews that I'm going to have you gather back, but you will gather everybody from the all corners of the earth. You're going to bring them back to me. This was the start of it. This is why we realize that in, in, in Isaiah 49, it's actually Jesus Christ that's, that, that's, having, that's having this conversation with God, right? And, and because, th look at what's happening here, that this, is, was, this was the start of the Gentiles being grafted in, right? Drop down to 44. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God, not just Jews, but Gentiles. I think they were in Antioch at this time. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. And they spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blasphemy. It, it makes you understand why Jesus said, have I labored in vain? Because the Gentiles started to hold on to it. They started to grab hold of it, right? And they started to praise God for it because they start being saved. They were preaching Jesus and they started receiving him, right? And the, and the Jews were upset about it. They was like, ah, they, and so... Because of because they started hating on the Gentiles, because the Gentiles, the Jews were stuck on the law. The Gentiles didn't have the law. They had the best thing. They had the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. The Jews could have had him, but they didn't want him at the time. Right. 
Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should have first been spoken to you. And it's talking about the Jews. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. This was the start. This is how you know that God, that it was Jesus and God having this conversation. Because you could see this transpire. For so have the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And only that can happen through Jesus Christ. That can only happen through Jesus. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. So when we go back to Isaiah chapter 49 and we read, we reread verse six, you see that it's talking about Jesus. He said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant. That servant is Jesus Christ to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. So once you establish that as Jesus talking, now you begin to under, that is the father speaking with the son. Now you begin to understand why Jesus may have made the statements. Then, then said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. There were some things at the time that Jesus, before his ascension up into heaven, there was probably some things that wasn't revealed to him as Mark told him. Mark, not Mark told him, but Mark, um, uh, the gospel of John, I'm sorry, in chapter five, verse 20, tells us that Jesus himself said that there were some some things that he didn't know that only God knew that he himself didn't know. That's a powerful thing in itself, because that begins. We know that Jesus has the embodiment of the Godhead, meaning there is God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. But it begins when you look at verse five of, of the gospel of John. There is a separation uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the father and the son, that there is an individual person, okay? When you look at, somebody said to me, uh, uh, God is like an egg. You got the outer shell, you got the yolk, and you got the, you got the uh, uh, what is that, the, the white, um, the white of the egg, the egg white. So you got the yolk, the egg white, and the outer shell. But what they fail to miss is that you can separate the three. Even though that's one, there is a separation. And each of those one has, has I don't eat eggshells. So, but, you know, the yolk has a different taste. The, the white, the egg white has a different taste. There is a different, there is a different person there. And, and so there is a separation there. So uh, there is this conception, there, there's not conception, there is this perception that that God left his throne in heaven and then he came to the earth and he put on this body and he called this body Jesus. Uh, but the scripture doesn't, actually scripture doesn't support that. The scripture talks about the oneness of God. That there is this Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Son was with the Father at the beginning. See, that's the thing about it. That's what you got to understand. The Son was with the Father at the beginning. And the father sent his son to this earth. And you can see them having a conversation here. Jesus even said in, in the gospel of John chapter five, verse 20, that not, he says, not even uh, the angels in heaven know the day or the, or, or the hour. Jesus says, not even the son knows that, but only the father knows that. So he spoke about the separation between them. Amen. So that's a that's a powerful thing. And once you start to understand this, everything starts to come together to give you a, a aha moment. When you look at what was happening in the book of Acts to where as they're preaching Jesus to the Jews, the Jews were still rebellious against it. But then the Gentiles started eating it up and then requested if they can join the next Sunday on the Sabbath, if they could come in on it. And when the next Sunday came, when the next day, when the, I'm sorry, not the Sunday, but when the next Sabbath came and they got in on it, they all began to rejoice and to, and to celebrate. You know, they received the word of God. Amen. And I'm just so grateful that God thought about us. Amen. Now, he's not done with the Jews just because they resisted him then. 
that's not the final story. Let's continue to read here because this is powerful. Verse 7. Thus said the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhorth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel and he shall choose thee. So God is going to set Jesus above all principalities, all powers, all thrones, all dominions. Jesus is going to be above all because Jesus was able to gather the whole world back unto God. And so God is saying that kings, you will be king of kings. You will be Lord of lords. They'll, they will bow down and worship you. Amen. Verse eight. Thus said the Lord in, a, in an acceptable in an acceptable time. I have heard thee and in the day of salvation have I have helped thee. And I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth and to cause to inherit the desolate uh, uh, heritages. Now, this is a powerful. God is saying at a at a at a particular time. Remember, they seem to be having a conversation, and then God tells them at a particular time you're going to go down there. And you're going to bring the whole world back onto me. But I, I can't just send you down when I want. This has to be at a particular time of my choosing. And, and in doing so, uh, he says thus, in an acceptable time, he's talking about a particular time. I've heard thee, and in the, in the day of salvation, I, I help thee. So God is saying that at this particular time, he is going to allow some things to happen to his son. But ultimately, uh, uh, he is going to resurrect him. And at a time of his choosing, he is going to allow his son to come in to be born in around or somewhere around the age of 30 or so. He started his ministry. Uh, uh, he laid down his life. He died and he was resurrected. God brings the whole earth back to him. Look at what he says here. And I will preserve thee, I'm, meaning that you will be able to continue to do what I've called you to do. And you, you will die, but you will be resurrected. Israel won't perish because of you. I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. You will be a covenant not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. Look at what he says. To establish the earth to cause to inherit desolate heritages. Hold your place there. This, is, this verse here, verse 8, is the fulfillment of of Genesis uh, uh, chapter 3. So let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. I told you this is real deep. This is a heavy, heavy prophecy that, that, that has uh, its, its, its magnitude, the weight of it. Genesis chapter 3, and we want to take a look at verse 8. So it says, They heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Okay? So they're talking, so it's talking about Adam and Eve, okay? And it said that they heard God walking uh, in the, there was a breeze that was going on and they, and, and they heard God coming. It's talking about Adam and Eve. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from, from, the, from, the, from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they hid, they hid behind some trees. The Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? This is heavy. When you study, the, there are some things that are not in our canticles. Okay, the, there are some books that are not part of our Bible. Uh, but there are some books out there that gives you an understanding of it kind of fill in the blank of what 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 the what our books what our scriptures kind of just not really gloss over but kind of makes mention in passing there are some books that kind of fill in the blank and 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 even if if it's not true it gives you kind of an imagination of what would have been so there's this book called uh, the book of uh, uh, of Adam and Eve I, I I I don't remember the title it's something to the book of Adam and Eve. But it gives you the, 
what they what their mindset was as being human, having once been created in glory, because they were actually in glory, and then having to fall in in a in, in, in a carnal state or a human state as we are. And so I make mention of that to say this. It's mentioned that Adam and Eve were in a state of glory. They had a, a some bright light around them. They they were like real bright, okay. They were like real bright because they were in a glorified state, which is kind of what we're going to be in when Jesus comes and redeems us. When when we finally uh, come to the end of our faith and we're living out our hopes and in, in the promise that God has has for us, when we live in that eternity, we're supposed to be. Uh, holy, we're, we're not just holy, but we're bright. Our, our essence, we're going to be bright, right? Well, I bring that up to say when God says, God says here, where, where art thou? He don't see him because he's hiding in the midst of his shame. He's no longer in a brightened state. He's fallen from that, that, that brightness. He's no longer in this brightened state. So God is like, where art thou, right? And then he says, uh, uh, he says, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. That's the first thing. When you fall into a state of sin, uh, you're no longer living by faith. You're, you're living according to carnality. There's this fear now. There's this shame. So he says, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The, the, sh the shame of your nakedness. Uh, and so you were never naked before because you had this, you have, you were clothed with bright light. And now because you distinguish that light through rebellion and sin, now you're naked, right? And so you hid yourself. So God said, how did you know you were naked? And then look at what God says. How did you know? Uh, uh, he says, who told you that you were naked? How did you know you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? God knows, but he's allowing them an opportunity to confess their sins. The man said, the woman whom thou givest, <laughs> this is a heavy, this is heavy. He blames two people with one verse, one sentence. The man said, the woman, he blames the woman whom thou gavest, then he blames God to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. He didn't take responsibility. He blamed it on, on the woman and he blamed it on God for giving him the woman, okay? The Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shall thou go, and dust shall thou eat all the days of thy life. So what happens is the enemy hid himself in the serpent. The serpent was not always a slithering beast. Apparently, the serpent was a, something that was good to look at, a gorgeous creature or something to look at. And the enemy chose itself, the enemy chose to hide itself within the serpent and use the serpent to deceive the woman. And then because the serpent allowed himself to be used of the devil and, and what have you, the God called the serpent to take away its appendages, if you will, and then begin to slither on the ground. And that's why I said dust would be in the face. But if you look at this, he's, if you look at what he says here, it, it gives you understanding that the serpent wasn't always made to slide on his belly. Uh, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and uh, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shall thou go. Why should God say upon thy belly shall thou go if you were never on your belly to begin with, right? And the dust shall thou eat all the days of thy life. Because as you're slithering, you're throwing dust in your face as you're moving about sliding on the ground, okay? Now, here's why I say that in Isaiah, this is a fulfillment of Genesis. Look at what this says. I will put enmity between thee and the woman. He puts the enemy on notice. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, uh, between thy seed and her seed. This is the fulfillment. It shall bruise thy head, 
and thou shalt bruise his heel. So God tells the enemy, you, you haven't won, even though man has fallen from grace, that's not the end of his story. I'm the same woman whom you use to bring man down. I'm going to use her to redeem man. And through his redemption, she will bring forth a son. And through that son, they will bruise your head. Even though you may bite his heel, there will be some that you'll be able to tempt. But you won't ultimately corrupt because I will save them. You may crucify him on the cross but I'm going to resurrect him from the dead. See, the enemy, God didn't tell the enemy everything. He just told him that the same woman you used to bring mankind down, I'm going to use woman to, to redeem mankind. And she will bring forth a son. And through that son, mankind will have power. They will be able to stand against you. They will bruise your head. This is that fulfillment. This is what you see here. Go in Isaiah 49, verse 8. Thus said the Lord, in an acceptable time, I've, I have heard thee, and in the day of salvation, I've helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth. Through what happened in the garden, all of humanity was brought down. But through this in verse 8, all of humanity will be redeemed, those that will receive uh, uh, Jesus Christ to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. Amen. So that's the that's the the uh, that's the fulfillment of what happened in Genesis, uh, the, the falling of man. This is the redemption of man that now we're getting a chance to read about. Verse nine, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth to them that that are in darkness, show thyself or show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways and their pastors shall be in high places. So. Look at what this verse says, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth. Hold your place there. One more scripture to reference. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Look at what this says here. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Uh, and then I'll read, he that descended is the same. Uh, he that descended is same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So it says that when Jesus died, he went down into the to the bowels of the earth. And then those that were in captivity, he preached to them the gospel. They received it. And when he was resurrected, they they were resurrected in his salvation. That's what it's saying here. Look at what this says. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto, unto men. Now, now he that ascended, what is it that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same. So when he when he ascended up into heaven, he freed some, gave them a state of rest. Those that that were bound when they died, having not received the gospel yet because he wasn't there. But he had to go down to save those that were there before his time, to give them an opportunity to be redeemed. Amen? And so when they heard and received that gospel, they were redeemed. So even though their bodies lay in state, their souls came up with him. Amen? And so he led captivity captive, if you will. That, and that's what this is saying here. That seems to be what it's saying here. Look at what it says in verse 9, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth. Those that were in shackles, those that were bound, uh, he's going to release them. Go forth to them that are in darkness. You don't have to live in darkness any longer. He's going to free you from sin, from shame. OK, show yourselves they shall feed in the ways and then the pastors should be in high places. Those desolate places that pagans used, you know, that that they were trying to worship false gods. God takes all that over, cleanses all that. And then allow his children to be there and use that for, for, for people to just be at peace now. Amen. 
They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat or the sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my valleys shall be, uh, uh, shall be exalted. So the valleys, the, the, the ways that are in the valleys, he is going to level the plain. There won't be high mountains or low valleys. It's going to be straight plains. And it's like God is going to redo things. And the things that were once hard and, and corrosive and, and too high or too low, he is going to level everything so that everything will be right as it should have been at first, right? And I will make all my mountains away and all my high, highways will be exalted. There will be no longer valleys. Everything will be a straight platform, if you will. Behold, these things, he said, behold, these shall come from far. And lo, these from far and north, these, these from the north and from the west, these from the land of Sinem. It's because of Jesus Everyone begins to be gathered back to the Lord our God. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth in the singing, O mountains, for the Lord has converted his people, uh, has comforted, rather, his people, and will have mercy upon uh, his, his afflicted. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. And you can understand why they say that because they go through the atrocities that they've gone through. What happened in 70 A.D., what happened during the Holocaust uh, uh, with Hitler. And of course, they ask, has God forsaken them because they had to go through these things? And then when, when we come to the end of days to where the start of tribulation, tribulation is, is, is about getting the, the Jews to... to, to to accept Christ, and they're going to have to go through something. And then the, the great tribulation, you'll have unbelievers having to go through, uh, not just the Jews, the, 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 trip, the first part of the tribulation, uh, they put their trust in the Antichrist. Okay, They put their trust in the enemy. They're deceived by the enemy. And then all of a sudden, after that, go, after that happens, uh, three and a half years later, the true colors of this Antichrist, he begins to, to really uh, to show his true side and begin to, to, to wreak havoc uh, throughout not just Jews, but all over the world, right? And so uh, all the things that the Jews have to go through uh, because of the wrong decisions that they've been making, of course, they're going to ask, has God forgotten about us because the things, the atrocities that they had to go through, right? But God tells us here in the next verses that he'll never forget about them. Behold, I've, he says, I've graven thee. I'm sorry, let me read verse 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, that they may forget. Yea, will I not forget. So God is saying that a woman, when she gives birth to a son, and, and then she breastfeed that son. Do she forget to do that? Uh-uh, she's very mindful. And God says, even if she does forget to do that, God says, I will never forget about you. If she ever forgets about it, if it's possible for her to forget that her son needs to be nursed or, or, or that she has a son to begin with, uh, I won't forget you. I'm not like that, God is saying. Behold, I've get, he says, I've engraved thee, that word graven, I've engraved thee upon the palms of my hands, thy walls are continually before me. So God is saying, every time I see my hands, I see you, I see your territory, I see your walls. Thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. And God is saying that there's going to come a time to where you will no longer have to worry about your enemies. Your enemies will have to worry about you, right? Lift up thine eyes round about and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, said the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them as with an ornament and bind them on thee as a bride. Though God is saying that I'm going to bring so many people back and you're going to see how populated everything is and then how you... Not only do you dress yourselves, but the way you'll dress others out of your joy, you'll be like ornaments, right? Like a bride decked out, right? That's how you'll be because you'll be so fascinated that I brought everybody back, that I gathered you all back to one to another, right? For thy waste and thy desolate places 
and the land of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants, and they that swallow thee up shall be far away. God is saying that you look at how desolate your places are, the time will come to where I will gather all of you back together, and you're going to be so populated that you're, you're going to feel like you don't have enough space. You need to expand, okay? The ch and then it says, your enemies, you'll never have, he repeats it, you won't have to worry about them, they'll be gone. The children which thou shalt have, after thou hast lost the others, shall say again in thine ears, the place is too straight for me, give me place, give place to me that I, I may dwell. When the, when the people come back to this land, they're going to say again, it's not big enough. The children that you may have lost, you're going to end up adopting some when, it, when it's all said and done because so many people will be back and their number one complaint will be there's not enough room here. What looks desolate now will be overpopulated because God is prof God in this prophecy, God is saying that he is going to fill the land of Canaan or the land of the, the, the land of Jerusalem, the land of Canaan, all in itself with people. All the even though it's going to is there's a time of desolation, but then there'll be a time to where it'd be overpopulated, right? And then he says, Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who has begotten me with thee, seeing I've lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who has brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where had they been? Now, when, when, when the time comes, they're going to, you may have lost kids, but then all of a sudden, in, in the atrocities, you may have lost kids, you may have lost family members, but God begins to restore the land and restore the people on the land. And, and, it, and you'll be such a tight community, you'll wonder, where have these gone? It's like you've been a part of my family all this time. You'll have someone to embrace. And it's because the Lord is gathering not just the Jews, but he's gathering the whole world unto himself, right? It's the fulfillment. It's, it's, it's powerful here. This is really powerful. Thus said the Lord God in verse 22, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. God is saying, I'm going to use the Gentiles to help bring the people back to the land. That, and that actually happened. When the Jews, I think back in the 40s, 1940s, when the Jews came back, it was the, the, the nations in which they were stand to allow them to come over on their planes, allow them to come over on ships. Any way that they could help out the nations did everything they could to participate in allowing the Jews to return back to their territory. That again, they gave them ships and planes to get them back. And that's what God is saying here. He says, uh, behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people and they shall bring thy sons in their arms. Thy daughter shall be carried upon their shoulders. Again, God used their platforms, their trains, their boats, to bring them back into their own territory. So we can see that scripture being fulfilled. Kings shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. God is saying that you look at your situation now and and you've come from being a slave when you were in Egypt, and then all of a sudden you're exiled and you're slaves again. Your land is desolate. The time will come to where you will rule the earth. The time will come to where other kings will bow down to you. Because Jesus himself, being king of kings, lord of lords, and he's the king of the Jews. And so because he reigns, because he reigns, the Jews reign. Right. And all believers reigns with him. Amen. And that's just how that's going to be going on in verse 24. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered the, the lawful captive delivered? God is saying, is it possible to God is saying this will come to pass as sure as it's it's impossible to rip the prey from from the um, from the mighty. A person that goes out to hunt and catches something, it's hard to take that from them, that which they captured. If a, if, if a bounty, uh, what do they call those, uh, um, our nowadays terms for a bounty hunter, if a bounty hunter goes out and capture an individual, 
that broke the law, uh, can you bribe him to let that person go? Right. It's the, the once they catch that, it's like the prize for them if they catch it. Then God follows up in verse 25. But thus said the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contended with thee and I will save thy children. So God is saying that that as captors go out and, and capture certain things and try to hold on to them. God says those that did what they could to capture uh, Israel, God is going to contend with them and rip them from ripped Israel from their hands. Amen. I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. So that's, uh, that's going to bring this study to an end. I told you there was a lot there to go through. Once you recognize the conversation that God was taking, that, that was taking place between the Father and the Son, and that seems that God was giving them a mandate and telling them how things was going to be, um, and then Jesus begins to share some of that with the Gentiles. He begins to tell us in verse one, listen, O owls unto me and hearken ye people from far. The Lord had called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother, had he made mention of my name. So Jesus begins to fill us in on what was taking place and to let us know that it's by no mistake that we were chosen to be a part of God's family. God, I thank you for such an understanding, for such powerful insight that you would allow us to be privy to what was once a mystery has now been made known, has now been revealed to those that are willing to hear and those that are willing to receive. We are living in a time that we find ourselves being so grateful to be your sons and your daughters. And it's because you've chosen us. The promise that you've made back in the garden, back in the days of the garden, the fulfillment of that has already started to take place. You are already calling so many out of darkness. We are falling in love with you through your only begotten son, Jesus, who is the Christ, for we have fallen in love with him. So Father, we thank you for not forgetting about us. We thank you for allowing your promises to, to, to be fulfilled. We ask that you would continue to call so many out of darkness. We even take this opportunity to pray for Israel, for we know that many of their eyes are starting, are starting to open and many of them are confessing that Jesus is Lord. God, we are so grateful for your master plan of salvation. Be glorified. Thank you for such a, a Bible study and such an edification to our spirits, God, that you would reveal unto us your truths and what you think about us, God. For we thank you so much. To God be the glory forever and ever. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Go with me quickly uh, to Matthew 11. I'll read through these very quick. This is the path. You can always find... Uh, if you go to our website, you can always find the path laid out for you to obtain the gift of salvation. We've read about what's going to happen to those that walk contrary uh, to the ordinances and the precepts of God. Those that are in con contradiction of his righteousness. The fate that will befall them. Here is how, here's how you are saved from that. It starts with Jesus Christ offering you an invitation to be saved. He says, come unto me. This is Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The one thing you got to understand is he, he, has his, he has the best life that he wants to give you. He's got your, he's got your interests at heart. That 
He wants you to come and join him. Be a part of the family. Come and be partakers of his kingdom, right? And then if he says, take and learn, he says, learn of me. Forget what they've been saying, what the world has been saying about me. You try me for yourself and come and learn of me. And what, and what you'll find out is how, is how I have your best interests at heart. You'll find that out, that I'm for you before I'm against you. You'll find that out. But, you, but when you come to him, you have to turn away from the world because it's not going to work in the kingdom of God. Remember, we spent the, the, better, the better part of an hour and a half talking about how the old world is going to fade away and God is ushering in the new world. He's ushering in the new heaven and the new earth. And the old is going to be done away with. And so now is the time for us to prepare for what will be. And Christ is offering us, the Messiah, Emmanuel, he is offering that platform, that bridge of transition and change unto us. Amen? Go with me to Romans chapter 11. Or chap Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Romans 10, verses 9 through 13. This is how you accept Jesus as Lord. This is how you accept his invitation. You first turn away from the world, because when he says, come unto me, that means leave the world behind and come to me. Now you commit to making him Lord of your life. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. You know how you give your wedding vows. You say, do, the, the man of God will say, do you take this man or do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded husband or your lawfully wedded wife? And you say, I do, right? Well, this is what you're saying to Jesus. That if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, you're saying, I do make you Lord of my life. That's what you're doing. I make you Lord of my life. I commit to marrying you and to obeying you. Okay? And shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's factoring in confession and faith. That you believe, you believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God that laid down his life for us and was and was brought back to life after three days and three nights and is alive forevermore. And he is the one that will reign and rule in the millennium. The safekeeping of our souls have been placed in his hands. Amen. And if you believe it and you confess that he is Lord, you are saved. What are you being saved from? We just covered that. We just covered that. That's you're being saved from the wrath of God that's going to fall upon the whole the whole world. Amen. I will go back and reference the Gospel of John chapter 3 and 36, but I want you to do it. It's basically saying what we've already said. Your re, your rejection of your rebellion against God and your rejection of his only begotten son. And, and that's the wrath. But if you take this path, you enjoy, you, 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 uh, excuse me. If you take this path, you're removed from the wrath that's going to come upon the earth. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so there's good and bad. That as God would punish the children of Israel, he will punish his children that are Gentiles. And the good is that a God was saving his children, the Jews. He's also looking to save us, the Gentiles. So there's no difference with God when it comes to salvation being offered between the Jews and the Gentiles. There's no difference when it comes to that. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to save you. He promises to do that. 
but you have to put yourself in position to be saved by turning away from your sins. That's repentance by confessing Jesus as Lord. Okay. Calling upon him and letting him know that I make you Lord of my life. Quickly go with me to first John chapter one, verses eight through 10. First John chapter one, verses eight through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is letting you know this is part of that path. When Christ says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is what it means to come to him, turning away from your sins and then let God know, let him know through prayer what it is that you repented of so that it never gets brought up again. God even takes it out of the enemy because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. At, at this time, he has, he has permission to go to the throne of God to accuse us right there at the throne. But the time is going to come to where he's going to be put into the pit. But until he's put into the pit, those things that you've been forgiven of, and that the blood of the lamb has washed you clean of. God doesn't give the enemy permission to, to bring it up. Because God himself is not trying to hear about it. And as long as you turned away from it. You disarm the enemy. You take away his argument against you. That's, that's the bottom line. But if you're still living in your sin. Then the enemy is constantly bringing it up. Because he wants God to penalize you. He wants God to turn him loose on you. Okay? And so, once you do what you're supposed to and you start walking right with God, then the enemy has to, he has to get up off of you. He can't even bring a case against you. He could try to make one, but he can't bring one. He could try to tempt you, but as long as you're covered in the armor of God and you resist him, he has nothing to complain about at the throne of God. Amen. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If you're not honest about what's broken about you, then you can't be saved. If you live in deceit and dishonesty, there's nothing that the word can do for you. Amen. Lastly and quickly go with me to Acts chapter two verses 36 through 47, Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. And I'll just read through this. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And what Peter is saying here is that surely those that have gathered here in this upper room on this particular day of Pentecost, that's the backdrop of what's going on here. Surely, those that are here, it's hard to believe that any of you would have taken nails and drive them through the hands of Jesus, crucifying them on the cross. Taking nails and driving them through the feet as he was crucified on the cross. But your lifestyle, those unrepented sins, those sins that you haven't repented of, that, that makes you just as guilty as those that had done that to him. Okay, you may say, I, I, I'm not doing all those things, but sin in your life, period, makes you just as guilty, guilty as those that had nailed Jesus to the cross. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and, bro men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to get our life in order when God convicts us? He's letting us know that there's something amiss within our lives and it's going to cost us if we don't get those things reconciled between him and ourselves. If we don't do our part to, to get a handle on that stuff, it's going to cost us, right? And God is convicting you to try to move you to take action, okay? So don't disregard those convictions. God got, he has that there for a reason. And that means that he hasn't given up on you. When he convicts you, it's because he hasn't given up on you. 
So stop giving up on yourself. Do something about what's happening with your situation. Take hold of it before God turns you over. You don't want him to turn you over. Amen. When I say turn you over, turn you over to the enemy or turn you over to yourself. That's the worst that he can do to you. So Peter says, repent, turn away from your sins first and foremost. Then Peter gives us the instruction, be ye baptized, you know, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the, for the remission of sins. Now, let's talk about the ceremony of baptism. Christ was nailed to the cross, laying down his life, meaning that he died on the cross, taken down off the cross and laid to rest in the tomb. He was laid to rest in the tomb. Remember, he was dead. For three days and for three nights, he laid to rest. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. Laid to rest, brought back to life. Okay? When we go through the ceremony of baptism, we are uh, some fully submerged in the water. That represents us being buried in Christ Jesus. Okay, when we go down into the water, being fully submerged, we are buried in Jesus Christ. When we come up out of the water, we are resurrected in Jesus Christ. Your old man goes down, your new man comes up, all of your sins are washed away. You remember in our Bible study, we talked about God getting rid of the old to make room for the new. This is the process of you inheriting the new, your name being counted amongst those in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is that process. Your old man has to be done and away with. Your new man has to come forth so that you can take part in the new world uh, uh, with the kingdom of God. Amen? That starts now. Your training of inheriting that which is to come starts now. But the old man has to go down. The new man has to come up. Amen. So that's the ceremony of baptism. That's why we do it. We're told to do it. And I've given you the reason of why we go through it. So that your old man can go down and your new man can come up and all of your sins can be washed away. So make sure you get it done. Amen. Um, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God puts his spirit inside of us to seal us up. We're the only ones that can break the seal. People contend with that statement that I make, but God is a God of free will. And if you don't want to be saved no more, you can you just be like, God, I'm tired of it. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's you breaking the seal. Okay? That's the only way that that the, the enemy don't have the, the the enemy don't have the power or authority to break your seal. He can tempt you to get you to break your own seal. You're sealed up. Imagine uh, you're being put in an envelope and that envelope is sealed up. Nobody has the authority to, to break that seal open but the Lamb of God and you. You can break that seal by saying, I don't want to be saved no more. I don't want to live according. To, and you go on about your life and you're perish with the rest. Amen. The, the enemy don't have, all he can do is tempt you to make you try to do it against yourself. So that's why God gives us his spirit so that he can be inside of us. His spirit is constantly uh, uh, transforming us on the inside out, giving you a hunger and a thirst of righteousness, making you, moving you towards prayer, uh, uh, getting into the doctrine of, of the word of God. You know, it's moving you towards those holy and godly things that when you were in, as a natural man, you thought these things were foolish. Now, because you're spiritual, having received the Spirit of God, and you're spiritual, these things are not, are not foolish to you any longer. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. God is always trying to call us out of darkness, but it's up to us if we're willing to come into the light that, he's, that he offers us. He's always, the invitation is always there. But it's up to you if you're going to accept it. And it don't matter where you come from or what, you, or what you've done. What matters is what you're willing to do at this point. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. That applies to us today. Save yourselves from this crooked or perverse generation. That applies to us. That's what 
we when reading about in Isaiah about those that didn't separate themselves, those that didn't call upon Jesus Christ to be Lord. Amen. And that's what that's what Peter is constantly telling us. We've got to take this thing seriously. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And now, and here is another path set before us how to grow stronger and closer to God. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayers. God keeps, when, when, whatever God used to get you saved, whether it's Bible study, uh, you, 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 you started following a friend to the place of worship and, and you received, you, you started receiving some truth. Whatever God has done to get you on the path to salvation, it takes a, a practice and a continuation of those things to keep you getting stronger. It takes a daily dose or, or a regimen of those same activities to not only get you stronger, but to see you to the end. Once you start pulling back on those things, then you're in danger of falling back. And once you're in danger, once you're, you're in danger of stopping, and from stopping, you're in danger of falling back, which in which is backsliding. So don't stop doing those things that got you to where you are. It you, it takes a continuation of that, a regimen of that, to keep you moving forward. Amen. Uh, verse 43, fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were, com were together and had all things common. This is the brotherhood. It's talking about the brotherhood. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with God. All the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God, we take this opportunity to thank you for the path of salvation, for the gift of life, the gift of eternal life with you and with Jesus, who is Christ. Father, I thank you also for calling all of us out of darkness and giving us an opportunity to take hold of that light. Father, those that have accepted the call, those that have accepted the invitation, we pray for them, that you help them to remain repentant. Father, that they accept Jesus as Lord and that they become sons and daughters of God and not return back to their former lust. We pray for them, Father, that you would place them in places of worship, Father, to where they can not only worship you, but magnify Jesus and edify our brothers and sisters. We pray that not only you fill them with the Spirit of God, but that you also give them an understanding of their gifts and callings and use them for the sake of your glory. It's our petition for those whom you've called out of darkness and have answered the call. Father, I thank you for increasing the size of our family and keeping the door open for us to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name, and we pray. Amen. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. If you have any unrepented sin in your life, you won't be able to take advantage of these blessings. Remember, sin brings about curses. Obedience brings about your blessings, right? And so this is a blessing. The word bless is littered all in this, right? But you can't let curses, you know, be a soldier at the gate uh, warding off your blessings, you know, because you, you got sin in the gate. So curses is standing outside of the gate, may, you know, bombarding any blessings that would otherwise enter in. So you got to do away with, you got to get rid of, the, 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 the sins in your life so that you can dismiss the curses that are standing guard. Uh, I watch, my wife and I, lately we've been watching The Lord of the Rings. 
I don't remember. There's three of them, man. <laughs> and if you ever go back and watch those, I mean, those like, if you watch all three of them, that's a good 12 hours, right? But they're very, if they, they really do have such a spiritual meaning to it. I don't remember which one, if it's the first or the second or the third, but there was a king. And this king had this, this um, like his, his, his hand, his, his right hand person had put some kind of spell over him. And so the king couldn't receive any counsel he was like a zombie. He couldn't rule. He, he couldn't give good orders. He couldn't call out good things. He couldn't, he couldn't acknowledge things. All he can do was be a servant to, the, to darkness because his right-hand person that didn't have his best interests at heart had a spell over him. It's similar to having, it's similar to having sin in your life. And that sin... It's stopping any goodness from coming at you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's deflecting any goodness from coming at you, right? And, and then outside of the, of the gates, it's got curses reinforcing the, the entrance to make sure blessings can't come in. That's how significant it is. So you got to make sure that you get sins out of your life so that you can fully embrace what God is trying to give you. Amen. Remember, it's a God of free will. So he is he he respects the fact that you choose curses over blessings. He respects that. OK. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I loose this on you that you would receive it in Jesus name, that you prosper, that you're transformed and that you're anchored down in the will of God and that you place not only God, but his kingdom first, always at all, and at all times that you yourself shall prosper. Receive the blessing in Jesus name. I thank you for your, your prayers and your proceeds and your support of the ministry. I love you. My wife and I, our family, we love you. And thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study.